Hi everyone, welcome to the Ravat Show. Super excited to be here today with Tony from BMC. Today we are diving into a topic that's reshaping our enterprises approach modernization not through migration but through understanding i'm joined by tony whose article starts with a simple but powerful drug before you even think about code conversion explain what do you have uh and we'll unpack why that step uh, you know gets skipped so often that we've kind of seen and what makes cobol to java conversion so complex uh, and much more uh, but uh, tony it's your debut super excited to have you on the rabbit show that uh, well you know what robert very happy to be here this is this is exciting for me as well awesome tony just for audience quickly wanted to get a intro from you your side and what do you do at bmc so i'm a devops evangelist uh devops architect for bmc software so i uh go around to companies and uh, customers and <clears throat> just in general places like the robic show <laughs> and um talk about sort of the art of the possible what can you do what can be done you know how can you modernize your mainframe to the point you made not so much to get off the mainframe but right. how do you take the best um the best platform there is and make it better that's fantastic uh tony i'm kind of also curious to know uh, a little bit about from cobol to java So, what's the biggest misconception people have about the uh, Cobol to Java conversion and mainframe modernization in general? Because you talk to a lot of community customers, and obviously, uh, you've been hearing this for years. Uh, so, what are your thoughts around it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think there, there's, there's a lot of. Um, I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions that are out there is. that all of a sudden i'm going to take my my giant you know massive monolithic co, uh, cobol application mm-hmm. and i'm going to turn it into java and all of a sudden it's just going to be beautiful you know it's just going to it's, you're going to convert it to java and it's going to be well performant and it's going to be so much better and so much easier and so much easier to read and the reality of it is no it's not going to be that way right now that um, this is no knock on ai or no knock cuz i'm as big a proponent of all that as anyone but the reality of it is if you take a horribly written cobol program and mm-hmm. run it through a converter then on the other side of it, you're going to get a horribly written java program probably even worse than the cobol program that you start cuz there's a layer of translation and abstraction in there right right so i i think that people are under the misconception that this is sort of a you know uh a mary poppins and a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down kind of thing right and it it's not mm-hmm. that case it's there is work involved in this regardless of whether you transform it to java or leave it in cobol or whatever these are these are malformed programs and all you're going to get is a malformed java program just being yep. blunt at least from what i've seen so far Yeah, uh, Tony, this is super insightful and uh, very helpful for our audience to understand. And you know, sometimes you paint a picture and it looks beautiful, but then it takes a while to get there. So that is very important. Uh, so I'm kind of wanting to dig a little bit deeper into why understanding comes first here. You uh, you also wrote that you know in the article uh, that mainframe code often resembles a decades of long game uh, and a uh, long game of telephone, right? So can you paint that picture for our listeners what does that look like in real life and what do you been hearing Yeah I mean think about this right so mainframe application development and I've said this in front of many many audiences and many many customers um Right mainframe application development froze sometime in the 90s the mid to late 90s mm-hmm. and never really refactored never really improved never really whatever now probably I'm going to have a bunch of people wanting to uh wanting to meet me in the parking lot after saying that a bunch of uh, old time mainframe developers but the reality of it is that mainframe development has just been stacking capabilities on top of the same applications over and over and over again for decades where now you're you're you know you're at a um you're at a national debt level of technical debt mm. where it's becoming unmanageable right you you don't have you you have all of this uh stuff stacked on top and the people that originally wrote it are either gone or it's so far 
in their past that they don't mm -hmm. understand where it's at. Right. They're asking new people to come in, even take out new new hires. So let's say experienced yep. developers to come in and try to detangle all that. And it it's just becoming a nightmare, right? So before you can do anything with it, you have to understand these programs. You have to understand where they came from and you have to start breaking them down into manageable pieces before you can start applying some of these other capabilities to them. Yeah, uh, that's so true in terms of, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the technical that, that that you kind of, you know, spoke about and then you also spoke about something which is about uh, things kind of, you know, obviously the people who have built this have also gone, but then uh, the modernization is happening, but it's slower than we can think of. Uh, I'm kind of also, Tony, wanting to learn a little bit about uh, your thoughts uh, around Gen AI. So how does Gen AI help teams uh, explain existing COBOL applications before any conversion begins? Do you have any thoughts around that? So, okay. and I think Gen AI's ability to explain programs is going to go back to what we just talked about, right? You have massive mm -hmm. amounts of technical debt and massive amounts of business logic that are built into, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of COBOL. How do you pick yeah. that out? How does a person pick that out? I mean, I'm, I think I'm pretty smart, but I know that would be an incredibly daunting task for me to take on. So now you have a system, you have a capability that can do the some of the heavy lifting in that for you, at least starting to identify patterns, at least starting to identify business rules, at least starting to explain what this is doing. So it can mm. give you a leg up in your ability to transform. And I mean, you truly need to understand that before you can just transform it. Or like I said, again, you you take Frankenstein and you run it through one of these and you get the, the, the you know, bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think that is something which is very interesting. And I like, uh, you know, how Gen AI is kind of, you know, also helping us to get to the next level. And it's getting there, slow and steady, but it's getting there. And uh, it obviously will take a little while to get to a level where we can be so confident about, you know, everything that we prompt and everything that we can get in terms of the results as well. Uh, I, I have a follow-up question uh, around mm -hmm. this itself. So what kind of, uh, uh, you know, insights or surprises typically emerge once teams, you know, start mapping dependencies and business logic? Any thoughts around that, uh, uh, Tony? So I think the kind, first off, I think the kind of surprises that come up are, I, I think that people have not dug deep into these applications for decades. And I know mm -hmm. I keep hammering this same this same mantra, but the, the reality of it is this is what the problem is. This is the root of everything. No one has dug into these for decades. And I'm going to be blunt. I think a lot of application teams, a lot of application developers, a lot of companies have forgotten the functionality that is in their system. They mm -hmm. know that they pass data in something modifies the data and it comes out in a certain state. But if you ask them to, to do a logic map or to trace, you know, uh, trace a, a, a piece of data through their system and what are all the rubrics and, and, and formulas that are, that it's subjected to, I doubt that you, you will have anybody that can do that on the mainframe side. No, right no. there. They're, and I think what's I think one of the big surprises is going to be people understanding exactly what these applications do. I think Gen AI is going to give us the ability to sort of scan all this, all this logic, pull out those business rules and understand what's happening. And I guarantee you a whole lot of it's going to end up on the cutting room floor. There's a whole yeah. lot of processing and things like that going on that probably doesn't need to be there anymore that yeah, people have yeah. just stacked a new piece of functionality on top of it and forgotten about it. Dead code, <laughs> dead logic, however you want to describe it. That is such an interesting perspective, Tony, and thanks for sharing that because it kind of, you know, obviously it is true in a way, which is where we've kind of seen that uh, happening where we are so dependent on so many different applications and it can be, you know, where the logic can be missed. Uh, I, it, 
just following up on this itself i'm kind of wanting to shift gears to little bit around code conversion dilemma as well uh, how do you distinguish between code explanation and code translation and why is that difference uh, uh you know uh, so critical for success i'm kind of wanting to know a little bit about that so how i would describe it is code explanation is taking an existing piece of code whether that's a whole module or even a snippet of code a function whatever that may be and reading it and basically understanding what that code is doing right and explaining it basically putting it in human readable terms so documentation for lack of a better term right right uh, um, i think that conversion is doing that exact same thing but then basically taking what it understands that program is doing and converting that into a new language java python c whatever that may be right mm -hmm. and i i mean i know that's a that's a very subtle distinction but it's a distinction nonetheless so i think you have to have explanation and you have to have good explanation to understand what's going on before right. you can do the conversion but then the conversion is basically taking truly understanding those business rules and those capabilities in context and then converting it to a new program because see that's the that's the key in there too is in context right right what are the upstream and downstream ramifications of the functionality that i'm trying to explain understanding what it does is one thing understanding how it interacts with the application as a whole is another and I think the conversion has to take that, has to do a deeper level of understanding and a deeper level of explanation in order to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I think uh, it is very important to understand that uh, and thanks for explaining that. Uh, I'm also uh, thinking to touch a little bit around refactor before rewrite and that is another, you know, section in the article as well. You advise teams to, you know, refactor before rewriting. What are the practical first steps for cleaning up code prior to translation? What are your thoughts, uh, Tony? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if, the, if you're going to do a full rewrite, you're going to have to sit there and pound through that 500,000, 600,000 million lines of COBOL code in order to understand what you're rewriting. And again, it's all about extracting the business rules. At the end of the day, there's two mm. key things to any code base, whether it's COBOL, PL1, Java, Go, Python, whatever. I write my program in order to have some kind of logic, in this case, business logic, to transform whatever I'm trying to transform or do whatever I'm trying to do. You have to mm. understand that and what it's doing from a business context in order right. to be able to rewrite it. And if you're trying to do that in a gigantic monolithic application with go to's and things like that, that's crazy. Like just just the logic flow of that is just crazy. So yeah. refactoring it and breaking it down into smaller, more manageable pieces gives you the ability to now tackle this in an agile way. I can yep. tackle it a chunk at a time and iterate through that before I start, um, how do I want to put this? Before I start trying to swallow the whole elephant. What's, you know, that old saying, you know, mm -hmm. how do you eat an elephant, like one bite at a time? How do you swallow an elephant, you know? So yeah. <laughs> that's, I don't know, maybe that's an old saying. Maybe I just made that up. I don't know, Rob, we, we could we could be breaking new ground here. I don't know. So the Rob, you heard it on the Rob <laughs> show first, so. Okay, that's great, Tony. And uh, how do you, how do you think about, you know, Jenny, I kind of supporting refactoring and documentation so the results uh, you know that java code is truly modern and maintainable how does jnf kind of factor in i'm kind of also wanting to learn from you yeah i mean i think gen ai is going to factor in. gen ai is going to be your tool to do the heavy lifting now that mm -hmm. doesn't negate you as a developer you as an application team you as a whatever having yeah. to understand and, and and do the do the the sweat equity of of, of doing it but what it's going to do is it's going to give you a tool that allows you to parse massive amounts of data and understand it in a very quick amount of time. Um, the analogy I use with AI a lot is think about back in the day when people used to build things. It was all hand tools, right? right. It was all, right. you know, hammers, saws. You had, if you wanted a board cut, you had to hammer it now. I can get a board cut in a second. I run it through a table saw. I run it through a band saw. I run it through some kind of machinery. I'm using forklifts and bulldozers and things like that for the heavy lifting 
That's what AI is going to be in this situation, right? It's doing your heavy lifting. You still have to build the house. You still have to understand how to build a house. But AI right. is going to smooth out some of the capabilities for you, right? I bet if you ask a construction guy, would he go back to hand tools just to prevent, you know, all the newfangled stuff from coming in? They would say no. No. And I think that's exactly. where we as engineers have to be today too, right? We have to use the tools that are available to us to make this easy. Yeah. Uh, I think that is so true and that is such a great example because uh, whenever there is a newer tool, it will only help you. The only thing is adapting that can take a little while. But once right. you're there, uh, you'll never go back to the old tools because this is much smarter, much faster. And that's why it's, uh, you know, obviously it's the talk of the town. Uh, I'm also uh, wanting to touch a little bit on the governance and validation piece here. Uh, so Tony, what to, you know, governance or validation uh, practices keep AI generated explanation and conversions reliable. Uh, how do you kind of, you know, obviously keep that in place as well? Well, I mean, you have to, it's the human factor, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to deaden AI's impact by saying a person has to be involved, but at this point, a person has to be involved, right? Yep. I, that governance needs to be a person overlooking what is being you what is being done what is being used and what is being spit out of ai to make sure that you know the whole the whole world the whole market the whole team isn't following a hallucination right 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 which we both know is is real i know that ai is you know basically going to cure leprosy here anytime now but at the end of the day ai isn't there yet and maybe it mm -hmm. won't ever be there maybe it won't ever be good enough to be in the context that we think, or at least not for the foreseeable future. So until then, it's a tool, but like any tool, the, you still, you know, a, a human still has to do the measurement. Yep. Yep. That's so true. Uh, Tony, uh, one final take that I want from you is hmm. uh, what one key takeaway would you give any mainframe professional thinking about COBOL to Java conversion today? Any advice, any thoughts, uh, what would it be? Yeah, I would say ask yourself what you're trying to accomplish. Start with right. the end goal in mind. Quit worrying about just converting COBOL to Java for the sake of converting COBOL to Java. Mm -hmm. Will it will it benefit you or will it not benefit you? And by you, I mean the company. I don't mean you as an the individual company. or yeah. you've like whatever. Will it benefit the company? Like what is the end goal in mind? Are you trying to be more efficient? Are you trying to bring in more resources because you think Java is mm -hmm. a more um, – uh, approachable language or you know is this to get off of the platform and move into the cloud like what is your end goal in mind start right. there and then work backwards because a lot of times i feel like people are applying ai and applying all of these capabilities it's a problem looking it's a solution looking for a problem right mm. versus starting with where do i want to be and going backwards from there right uh i think that is so true you know obviously looking where the problem is and then going back forward it's more like the reverse engineering that you need to do and understand what your problems are and then uh what are you trying to solve your uh tony i promise this is the final question and this is about you and your no team if they, if they want to uh learn more about the different content that you all push out if they want to understand uh you know more in depth about cobalt to java which is the best place i know you all you and mark kind of go out and put out a lot of articles i'm obviously going to be sharing this article link with them yeah. but yeah. if they want to follow you if they want to follow the resources is that you all put out which is the best place to do that so, i would say start at bmc.com there's an absolute okay. ton of diet i know that's a very simple answer to that question but that's your route and from there you have all of our articles all of our documentation right. all of our capabilities all of that stuff and i so i think bmc.com is your one-stop shop think about bmc.com like an oyster right and yep. when you pop that oyster open there's a big pearl inside of it Okay. Mm -hmm. so BMC.com is where you get all where that's that the BMC.com is your oyster and the, the information is your pearl. Fantastic. Uh, this is great, Tony. Uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for giving us all the insights. Uh, very helpful. And I've learned a lot and I'm pretty sure the audience for those who wish to also connect with Tony, I think LinkedIn is the best place to connect with him. Absolutely. Go and connect with uh, Tony there. Uh, thanks once again, Tony, for do doing this. Really appreciate it. And uh, definitely looking for a 2.0 very soon.
Yeah, thank you for having me, Robert. It was a great time. I love doing the show. Um, hopefully, we'll talk in the future. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, everyone, thank you. for joining us today.